Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. Whoo, man. Today's about prophecy. That's what Jesus is doing today. He's drawing attention to the prophets. He's prophesying himself. And it's important that we understand what prophecy is and what it isn't. Prophecy is not fortune telling, right? A prophet is not one who sits over a crystal ball to look in to see what the future says and then announces that to everyone. That is not prophecy. That's not what that is. Prophets tell the truth. If I say to you, if you drink and drive, bad things are going to happen, am I predicting the future or am I telling you the truth? Telling you the truth. That's what prophets do. They tell the truth. They look at the way the world is, and they juxtapose that against what God's vision of the world is. And they bring that to powerful people. So prophets speak to two groups of people. They speak to the oppressed. But they speak to these two groups differently, the oppressed and the powerful. They, when they speak to the oppressed, you never see a prophet coming to the oppressed saying, you need to do better, right? You need to, you need to figure things out. You need to get your act together, which I think sometimes that's what we do. We, we look at people who are oppressed. We look at the downtrodden. We look at the poor, and we judge them. We judge them. Prophets don't do that. They don't judge the poor. You hear prophets say, comfort, comfort, oh my people, right? On this holy mountain, the Lord will make a feast of rich foods, well-aged wines for all people. Tears will be wiped from every face. Uh, the shroud of death will be, will be gone. This is what prophets say to the poor, to the disenfranchised. But to the power people, prophets are tough. They come and they say, the way you're living, what you're doing does not align with God. Prophets look at scribes and Pharisees, right? Jesus said, you're, you're like tombs, he said to the scribes and Pharisees. You're whitewashed on the outside and dead on the inside, right? Prophets are tough, but not toward the oppressed. And that's what is really important to remember here. As Jesus went out and, and did his ministry, when he encountered the oppressed people, what did he do? He welcomed them. He loved them. Think about the woman at the well who had been married multiple times. And how many pastors have preached sermons that she was a harlot? She was not a harlot. It's important that we remember women at the time of Jesus were property. Women made no decisions about who they married. Their families made those decisions, not their families. The husband, right? The, their father would make these decisions. And if a woman was married and, and maybe divorced, or the husband divorced her, or maybe that person died, she would then be formed to somebody else. And when it says she's had five husbands, and the man she's living with now is not her husband, that's not a judgment against her. That's telling you that she's been a piece of property sent from man to man to man and, ha and has ha had no say over her life. And Jesus loves her. And he takes a drink from her. Powerful. Jesus encounters a leper. He doesn't shame the leper for having leprosy. He doesn't ask, how did he get leprosy? Why did he get leprosy? What did, he, what did you do to anger God that you got leprosy? Which is how the people there were, were shaming lepers. No, Jesus went and he touched the leper. And he healed the leper. We live in a, in a society where we, we want to be powerful. And we want to be right. And often we, we, we're right at the expense of others. We have power at the expense of others. When a prophet comes and brings a strong prophetic message, if you don't like it, it means you probably have power. And you might be misusing it. When a prophet comes and says, people with brown skin are being oppressed and held back systemically. There are systems in place that hold folks with brown skin back. And those with, with lighter skin have privilege that people with brown skin don't. If you go, ah, oh, that's it, I don't like it. Guess what? You probably have power. If you hear that message as good news, if you hear that message as 
Thank you for, for sending this, this message to us, Lord, of equality, of oneness. Then you probably, if you're not oppressed, you at least can relate to the oppressed. If you hear a message that women are being unfairly treated by men, men still make more money than women in the workforce. You look at all that's been going on with like the soccer association, you know, and, and, and the men's soccer team makes more money than the women's soccer team. And we can still see the inequity between males and females in our culture. If that doesn't come as good news for you, if you're offended by that, then you're probably in a position of power that you don't want to lose and give up. The people who reject prophets are people of privilege. They're people of power. They're people of authority. Now, I'm really going to get itchy. Because think about how the church has misused our, our power. What if the church is Jerusalem? Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stone, stones those who are sent to it? You know the church, the Christian church in America, we gathered up Native kids. And we took them away from their Native American communities and their Native American culture, and we tried to make them white. We put them in white communities, white churches. We did that. The church did that, right? The church taught and still teaches in some places that women can't be clergy. Because of your gender, you're not equal to men. Men can be clergy. Men can have these positions of power, but women cannot. We've divided people over poverty. The wealthy get the nice seats. Those of us who, who pull ourselves together, we, we, we get to make decisions in church. But the poor, we'll do ministry to them. We're not going to listen to them. We're certainly not going to put them in a position of authority in helping make decisions in the church. I mean, the list is long of how we have, we have not listened to the voices sent to us. Why does God, why does the Holy Spirit keep sending prophets? Why does the Holy Spirit keep sending a message, a voice, to point out when things are not okay? Because God loves the poor, and God loves the wealthy. Jesus teaches us to pray for our enemies, to pray for those who curse us. I'm watching everything going on in the Ukraine right now, you talk about a, an abuse of power and, and the need for prophetic voice, right? But I was talking to Pastor Jay, and I said, you know, if, if Vladimir Putin died, I would have a hard time grieving. But at the same time, I can't advocate for his death. Because you don't end violence with violence. We pray for his conversion. We pray for his transformation. But not just his. Anyone who's misusing power in the world. We can't create peace in Ukraine right now. You and I can't. We don't have the ability to do that. But we can pray for peace. But you know where we can create peace? You know where we can create justice? In our home where we treat everybody as a child of God, equal. It doesn't matter who they are, what color their skin is, male, female, rich, poor, in our workplaces, in our neighborhoods, wherever we go, in our schools. My goodness, we need work to be done in schools and creating justice and, and well-being for, for all people. I haven't even mentioned the LGBTQIA community, right? And the injustices that are uh, done in the name of God against LGBTQIA as though they're somehow not human anymore. We can't create justice around the world, but we can do it within our own spheres. Can we hear the voice of the prophet? Can we hear the voice of the Holy Spirit? Can, can our eyes see like the eyes of Jesus when, when a person is suffering or struggling, can we recognize that we have means, we have abilities, we have resources, we have agency to do something to make a difference in this community and in this greater world, one person at a time? I believe God's trying to get the church's attention right now. Right now. 
I'm 55 years old. In May, I'll be 55. May 16th. Send me a card. No, I'm kidding. You don't have to do that. You don't have to do that. I'm going to send my mother flowers on my birthday. I call it her birthing day. Yeah. Happy birthing day. Um, I'm 55 years old. I, I don't remember a time in my life like this where there's so much division, so much violence, so much chaos, so many people hurting. At Abiding Hope, we've had two suicides in the last two weeks. I did a suicide funeral on Friday for a 34-year-old husband and father. The one on, the, the funeral we're going to have on the 26th is a 28-year-old. We have, we have young people, teenagers, going into psych units because they're cutting, because they're, they're suicidal. Because one, A 16-year-old last week asked his parents to be emancipated. He doesn't want to live at home anymore. Mom said, where will you live? He said, I don't care. I live in my car. I don't care. It's not really his car. It's their car, but he thinks he could take it, right? <laughs> Things are bad right now. It's really hard. It's tough for everybody. We're all hurting. We're all stressed. It's hard to see the future. It's hard to see what's coming, what's going what, to what's happen over the next... I mean, this is an election year. That's going to be fun, huh? That's going to be fun. Can we hear the voice of the prophets? Can we hear the voice of the Holy Spirit? We're being called into a way of life that produces life. And there is one death we can, we can advocate for. One death. I don't believe that you solve violence with violence, but the one death that you can be for is your own. And I'm not talking about a physical death. I'm talking about a death to ego, a death to pride, a death to greed, a death to selfishness, a death to privilege, a death to all of the things that separate and divide us as human beings. Jesus was willing to die. He was so powerful that he never used his power against other people. He, he could have wiped out who knows who, right? But he never took his power and put it to use to hurt, to tear down, to attack. Even when he cleansed the temple, when he chased out the money changers, remember that story? He didn't hurt anybody. He didn't hurt anybody. He was making a statement about the misuse of people because what they were doing at the temple was pilgrims would come to offer sacrifice and at the temple they would charge them exorbitant amounts for, for the animals or, or, and then they had to change their, their uh, Roman coins into Jewish coins and they would charge them extra for that. And so the, the temple elite were getting fat off of the piety of the pilgrims. That's why he flipped those tables and said, get out of here. We're not gonna, we're, this isn't how we're going to treat people. This isn't what God wants for humanity. This isn't what, what God dreamt of when God created all of us. We need to stop taking advantage and oppressing and hurting one another. Can we hear the voice of the prophets? Jesus went to the cross in solidarity with all who suffer and die. He died as a poor man. He died as an ethnically oppressed person. He died at the hands of, of the power figures, not just the, the political ones, but the religious ones as well. And on the third day, God raised him from the dead, and Jesus was unrecognizable. The resurrected Christ was unrecognizable because he was raised as the new creation. The new creation. Wounded still. Really important that we remember that. Still had the wounds. And the wounds weren't anything to be ashamed of. The wounds are just a part of life. You can't go through life without getting some wounds. Amen? But he was a new creation. He was the new vision of humanity. He was the new human race. And he breathed into his, his disciples and said, As the Father sent me, so now I send you. Go. Go and love. Go and serve. Go and be generous. Go and break down barriers that separate and divide. Go and, and fight against oppression. Not with violence, but with love. Sometimes we have to resist, right? That's what the whole civil rights movement was about. Civil disobedience. There wasn't violence, 
from the, the, the Martin Luther King group, the, the African-American group. There wasn't violence coming from that direction because they understand, stood we can't end violence with violence. Same thing happened in South Africa. Same thing happened with Gandhi. We have examples of how society, how the world can be transformed in the name of love. Are we willing to be those people today? So when you're at home with your family, close friends, and somebody starts to get divisive, we have to find a way to speak against that, to honor the humanity of all people. People can have their own political views. Let them have their own political views. It's a problem when one's views start oppressing or putting down or holding back others. That's a problem, and we need to work against that. Are we listening to the voices in the neighborhood? Listening to what the needs are right now? Listening to where the pain is? What does it mean for this congregation, this building to be a light on the hill that everyone who lives around here knows? You, you, you're in a hard spot. You're in trouble. You go to Christ the King. They're going to love you. They're going to accept you. They're going to help you. What does it look like for us to lead the movement of love and oneness and compassion in this world? We're on our way to the cross. And we're on our way to the empty tomb. That's what Lent is about. We're journeying together to Good Friday and to Easter Sunday. I hope that over the next several weeks, you'll be praying about this, meditating on this, contemplating on this. What is the Spirit saying to you? What are the places in and around you where you're being called to be different, to love, to forgive, to break down oppression? to break down privilege. It doesn't have to be glamorous, you know, on a stage in front of the whole world. It might just be with a few people, some neighbors, that for the first time, you've heard racist things said, but for the first time you're going to say, I'm not comfortable with that language. Please don't talk to me like that. Let's, if you want, I can introduce you to a person, a minority, that would change your mind about the very thing you just said. I think we have to speak up. We have to take a stand. We have to recognize that it might cause us to be oppressed. The reaction might come back against us because that's what happened to Jesus. But if that's the case, so be it. May our lives be living sacrifices. Romans 12, read that chapter. May our lives be living sacrifices presented to God so that we and all the world may experience real life. God loves each of you, and I do too. Amen.